Right, the Eve August Polka. Hi, hello, and welcome to John O'Sullivan from the Irish Pagan School. And today I'm answering a, a bit of a question that, well, I don't even know if it has an answer. I'm exploring a question that we asked commonly. Um, I was just making and having a coffee, and as ever, I put my dad the offering of fresh cream in his coffee on the altar. And it brought to mind the question that a lot of people ask us is, what does the dag that look like? So um, it's it's an interesting question we're considering. And in order to do that, we need to look at what he does in all of our stories and all of our tales. So the first thing really to understand is that we're dealing with old stories, really old stories. And the odd and interesting thing about all of those old, old stories is that when they were started, when all of these stories began, people knew the characters that were being talked about. Um, and as the, they were carried down through the ages, as they were passed on and retold from bard to bard, people knew these characters and like were familiar with them. And so you didn't need to start every story by physically describing, oh, well, he was six foot tall, like, you know, dark hair, blonde face, blonde hair, blue eyes, whatever it is. Um, and that leads to tales that we have now where the the words that describe the deities are more descriptors of their actions and their deeds or kind of almost the energy or the colors or like, you know, what what they're associated with as opposed to their physicality. Then to make things even more entertaining and interesting, we throw in the fact that they're gods and, you know, masters in druidry, if we're talking about the Dagda specifically, or the Morrigan, when we bring in the aspect of shape-shifting, where she can literally be any shape she fucking needs to be and chooses to be for whatever she wants to pursue or whatever task she wants to fulfill, from like an eel in the river to a, a she-wolf to a, a red-made heifer to um, a washer at a ford, an old woman to a young woman. Um, all of these different things just really show that like there is no set conforming form that is that they are bound to. Um, but there are those descriptor words. When we talk about the bive, the bive is also referred to as the red-mouthed bive. You know, which is doesn't mean that, you know, she has a red mouth. It's more indicative of her carrion crow form and like the gore of the battlefields or the hooded crow aspect of it. So uh, there is a lot of allegory and imagery woven into these tales because they are tales, they're stories. You know, you talk about Sun Face Lou. That doesn't mean he was a sun god. It just means that he was really, really good looking. And people are like, oh, geez, the sun shines out of his face in those circumstances um what is interesting though is that we do get a description of the dagger in the stories um a physical description and this is one that taken out of context has been used to generate a lot of art around him and in order in, in almost many ways to caricaturize the the irish deity himself and that's where we get a little bit of a problem with how people pigeonhole based on a paragraph. So um, I have that paragraph here and I'll read it to you. So it comes from the Kothmog Tura, the second battle of my Tura, And the translation I have was done by Elizabeth Gray. Um, so this description, I'll just I'll read it out and then I'll set the context for you. Probably the best. Um, it was not easy for the warrior to move along on account of the size of his belly. His appearance was unsightly. He had a cape to the hollow of his elbows and a grey-brown tunic around him as far as the swelling of his rump. He trailed behind him a wheeled fork, which was the work of eight men to move, and its track was enough for the boundary ditch of a province. It is called the Dagda's Club for that reason. His long penis was uncovered. He had two shoes of horsehide with the hair outside. So that is the physical description that we get of the Dagda, and there's a lot of art that has been generated based on that physical description. Um, and it's not the most flattering. 
<laughs> if you be honest, like, you know, wearing kind of ill-fitting clothes, like your butt hanging out, you know, just dragging along, like, you know, the it, essentially when we look at the type of clothing that's being worn there, it is rough peasant clothing. Um, and that does seem to be at odds with the nature of the deity itself. And so that's where we need to be able to look at things in context, because what's actually happening in this part of the story is Dagda has been sent by Nuada to spy on the arrival of the Fomorian invaders in the precursor to that second battle at Moitura. And so in order to you know, present himself into that camp, he goes in disguise. He humbles himself down in order to try and find a way to get in, get information, and not escalate the violence. What actually happens to him in that story is in any other way, like, you know, th th actually, there is no other way of saying it. He is abuse, you know, under the rules and the obligations of hospitality and literal threat of death, he's forced to consume a porridge, which is made with a whole lot of awful, like full goats are put into it and oats, but then all of the the kind of the, the off meats, the bad meats, um, well, not that there's any bad meats, but it's, it's, it's not a great it's not like a, a bountiful food. It is literally made in this big, huge vat. And then in order to serve the porridge, it's poured into a ditch. So they, they pour it out. The Formorians, Indech, the king with his invading army, pours this out into a ditch in the ground and threaten Dagda and say, listen, unless you eat every single part of that, I'm going to kill you. And so Dagda does. So he sacrifices his his dignity in many ways. He sacrifices his physical form. So when we talk about his belly being distended, it is distended from the feet that he did, which was consume this vast trench full of food so that the Fomorians had no cause to, to threaten him or to escalate the violence that they're looking to escalate. Um, so it's a rough story. It's a tough story for this, this god because he puts himself time and again at a, a sacrifice really in many ways for that tale you know his physical form he has he, he literally has the shit kicked out of him later in that story um he is leveraged and put upon to carry the daughter of Indek on his back across the country humbling him um and she then like courses him into a sexual encounter at the end of which in essence, like, you know, because he gave no offense, he gave no harm. You know, she had no reason to go back to her dad with, you know, an escalation for war. She realizes, like, whose side she should really be on. So that is the description that we get for the Dagda. But there are so many other words that are used around him that describe him in, in different ways. And so those other words are his other names. When we talk about um, Rua Rovasa, and um, the red one of knowledge, or the great one of red, not uh, the red red one of great knowledge, um, the rua that word rua is red, but it's not red as in the color red. It is the red as in an auburn or red hair. So, the fact that that word is used specifically on, in multiple ways, eighty rua is another name applied to him. Um, it is the fact that he has red hair, like it's this you know, coloration of hair and beard that is on it. We know that he had beard as well because that was, do we actually? Do I have that? No, and I think this is where the, the, the challenge comes. I suppose culturally speaking, um, if we put him within the time frames of him coming into Ireland, you know, it was common for there to be beard bearded men, but it's not standard. It's not expected. Um, But he has always presented to me with a beard. So it's it's an interesting one. And this this really exemplifies where we're going with this, the fact that we can explain, but we can't answer. We can't say for sure, because my experiences of the Dagda and my exploration of the lore and the stories and how they inform my awareness of him is then colored and ch changed through my perspectives and my interactions with him as a, an energy and as a deity. And that's where it's, important to be cautious about how and when we approach these things so like other stories that we need to look at of course is his physicality he's said to be very strong like um when his son angus kind of gets himself in over his head and he comes to the his dad and he's like oh I've, I've made a promise i really can't keep it said the diet clears an entire forest in one night 
himself. And then the next night, again, Ingus makes promises. This is all in the wooing of a ton, by the way, that story. And the dag that draws out the land, draws out rivers on the new plain that he has just made by felling all the trees in order to irrigate it so it becomes a place to grow. When we look at him, like battling the Mata uh, at Merhevna, where he kind of casts out this this sea monster in some ways um, and like drives literally the ocean back off the land. You know, there's so many very physical feats that he's he's kind of engaging in. Even if we go back to the very beginning, the first battle of Moitura, when the two of the Danon arrive into Ireland, the Dagda literally charges a flank of enemies, the Firbulag, on his own and opens up a gap fit for 150 warriors to follow after him. So time and again, we have these very physical acts of of conflict, but then of also service. When when Bress is the king, um, the Dagda is put in a role of digging. Like, you know, he, he is an earth mover. He moves and digs all of the trenches to build the security of Rath Bresh, in, in, which is the Hill of Tara. So there's a lot of physicality around him, but it's not the physicality of a a bodybuilder. You know, his 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 form, the Dagda's form from all of the stories is a strong man. You know, it's if you were to look for correlations in physical form today, you're you're actually looking not at bodybuilders, you're looking at strongmen. You're looking at the people who can lift and he- move objects, who can fell trees, you know, um, who can dig and carry and move. It's all of that big body physicality. And that then leads to that large shoulders and in many ways, large core frame and big gut because, you know, his appetite is in keeping with the energy that he generates or that he gives out or that he expends in service to his community. So um, the last thing we always say is the thing that the Dagda, oddly enough, describes himself. In that story with the the arrival of the Fomorians. And I think I have the, the, do I have the full quote here? In the story with the arrival of the Fomorians, when Index Daughter is sent to, to kind of put upon him or to shame him to try and generate some kind of slight that she can take to her father, um, she demands that he carry her on her back after literally kicking the shit out of him. Um, but he says he can't do it because it's 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 beholden to him not to carry anyone on his back unless they know his name. And so she then puts upon him three times to tell his name. And what we eventually get is uh, a Rosk poem. And Rosk is one of the oldest kind of like poetic expressions that we get in Old Irish. And so what he actually says in this poetic like clarification is uh, for Ben Bruch Brogal Bromage Kerboid, cock, rullug, bullock, lower, cirque, devrig, all of her buff, afghan, befby, brick tree, tree, carboid, ross, rimry, rig, scosby, osby, olithby. So that's a very interesting form of words. And there's actually um, an entire kind of document kind of written about that, an entire story written about how to understand or to translate those words. That um, that that work is actually done by uh, an old Irish translator by the name of Isol de Bullock on Carmody, who does story archaeology, which is an amazing pod- podcast in Ireland. Um, this is the book that it's in. I'm holding up a book. It says Harp, Club and Cauldron, uh, A Harvest of Knowledge. This is done by Elon Otter Press. Um, edited by Laura O'Brien, Morpheus Ravenna, and myself. It's only in physical copy at the moment. There's no digital copy. Um, so it, it actually breaks down the Ross poetry, that kind of listing of names, because the fascinating thing about it is that the words themselves have meanings, but then the meanings of those words change based on their connection position with the words before and the words after. And so you might say the word fair at the top is the the word for man, you know, um, for Ben. Uh, ben is uh, either hills, peaks or horns as in antlers. So you might be for Ben an antlered man or it could be the man of the hills or man of the peaks. And so when you begin to build in all of these other words, like you get to 
um, the word brogol and bromage, you're talking about this large lapped farter, which is the word bromage. Um, and on occasion, I refer to him as my bromage. <laughs> um, but it it's this idea of rollog bullock, this, this, this bullock being tummy or stomach, and it's like kind of large, like stomach. So we have this large lapped, large stomach, man of the peaks, a man of the mountains, man, mountain man. Um, but then you throw in words like the tree cardboard cotch or, or Ross, which is a tree on account of a tree wheeled chariot. Um, when, when we talk about Rig and Rimra Rim, there, um, those are linked with kingship, like, you know, Re being the Irish word for king. So there's so many different ways to translate those words themselves, these descriptors that, that are applied to him by him himself. And it shows that there is a lot of different layers to the wording of the poem as it's expressed, but then also the deity himself to be able to define himself or express a description of him or the naming of him in that particular format of poetry. So really uh, to bring it all together, like, you know, what, what does he actually look like? It's hard to say for sure. You know, I know I have my personal experiences and my interactions with him. And I think what is important to really understand is that the Dagda looks like what the Dagda has almost always looked like. Um, and by going through those stories, by exploring those tales, we get a better understanding of how he is defined and how he actually is and manifests based on what he does. He is a chieftain. He is a warrior. He is a king. He's a father. Like he is all of these different things. He's a musician. He plays the harp. So whatever physicality comes along, those aspects need to be brought into it. You know, his digging out the ditches, his felling of trees means he has that big strong man form. But he's a warrior, which means he knows how to move it. He knows how to use his muscles and use his form to the best advantage. You know, he's not a berserk. He's not a rager. He's a, he's an actual champion and a warrior. But his hands then, his hands would be calloused. They would be heavy. They would be kind of, you know, thick skin from all the manual labor and effort that he actually does. But he still plays the harp, which means he's going to have the the tip, the strong tips of fingers to move the harp strings, but then also the the digital agility to be able to weave out these tr mystical songs that woo people to 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 laughter or to to mourning and crying or to sleep. So there's all of these different things that we need to kind of build into our understanding of the Dagda. And it's that more than anything else, which helps us define or, or kind of get a glimpse or get a perspective on what the Dagda looks like. So um, I hope that has been interesting. I hope that's given you a bit of an insight, you know, but at the end of the day, all we have is those stories, all we have is those descriptors and our own personal relationships and experiences and how they inform us. So if you found this interesting, please, you know, feel free to do the like and the subscribe kind of message down the bottom. Actually, in fact, throw a comment in, you know, if any of this kind of fits with how you view the Dagda or how the Dagda manifest or you perceive the Dagda in your own experiences, I'd be delighted to hear that too. So, you know, pop it down in the comment and let me know. And until the next time, take care of yourself, look after yourself. August Long. Bye.